Henry Dills. Music City at, at 10 minutes after 10 by this asshole juvenile cop that used to like to get back to the station at Wilcox and uh, you, had, you, you had to be home by 10 o'clock. So you broke curfew. In, in, in the 50s yeah. you had to be home by that time and uh, it was an insane law. So my brother came down and picked me up, and he was really pissed at the cops. But, yeah, yeah. Well, we don't have to disclose all the records, sir. Right? <laughs> <laughs> that, that you were busted honest. in Laurel Canyon. You were busted in Laurel Canyon, all right. Well, real quick, yeah, I was, I was in Pandora's box at the wrong time. <laughs> I, did, I didn't pay a jaywalk. Notice how these guys are proud of this. <laughs> <laughs> this is good. I didn't pay a jaywalking ticket. <laughs> It came and took me out of my, my place on, on Stanley Hills Drive. But there's three people on this panel that picked me up hitchhiking in the late 60s. <laughs> yeah, come on, you're the only woman here. What's your story? Uh, okay, well, actually there's a payoff to this. Um, I was in the wrong place at the wrong time with a bunch of guys who were actually drug dealers. And there was nothing, I, I had just met this guy, so I just gotta make a quick stop. We walk in the door, and I'm looking around, there's, there's no furniture. Already very suspicious. I look in the kitchen, which is straight ahead, open a cupboard, and there's all, um, you know, like capsules that you use to drugs in and all this and then five seconds later the door smashes down and cops tons of cops oh with um you know uh, bulletproof vests and their guns cocked and all that just came in handcuffed everybody pushed everybody face down on the floor except me and so they all fell on this concrete floor face down i don't know if any of you have ever had that experience you know uh, you know with your hands behind your back and face down Okay, and then um, they took me into another room to interrogate me, and, they, and my handbag was there, and they kicked it, and all this marijuana came out. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, your arrest, um, my uh, arrest, all that stuff is actually documented in Frank's songs, and there used to be a map that we published, the Freak Map, and it had the card, which was the real agenda for the police. Um, they wanted people to work for them, and they gave me a card and said, you know, we want to bust these people. You go to these parties, and you know, I was one of those, but I, w I never did it. I had, to, I had my other ways and means of getting out of it. But I just want to say, well, maybe I'll save it. Maybe I'll get a chance to say it later, but, oh, I know what it was. When it comes to museums, um, you mentioned at the top of the show, I'm sorry I'm taking all this time, but there are only four photographers that I'm indebted to, one of which is sitting here. Had and then there was uh, oh, a. <laughs> sorry, sorry, sorry. I'm so sorry. And, there, and then there's three others that took pictures over the years of Frank. Um, but it's so great that you did document so much of the Laurel Canyon. And the thing is, when but you do have an exhibit a lot of guitars. So I just have to say, come on, what that is a big deal to have so many guitars. Right. And when uh, all those guitars got stolen over the years, you know how they try to prove the provenance? They tell you, you have to have the police report reporting it stolen. And I go back to the fact that all of us were arrested, and many of you in the audience probably, and nobody was friends enough with a cop to report a stolen guitar. 
So guess what? <laughs> well, we started out just very educational. <laughs> Sixth grade class coming in as we all learn. <laughs> Where's TMZ for this? <laughs> All right, look, so I gotta start, Henry, officially. Uh, I wanna start off with you because we, we alluded to you really chronicling the whole periods, getting going in the 63, like, 64. The, the scene in its earliest days was hardly a scene at all. Why don't you take it from there? What, what was it like in 63, 64 in Laurel Canyon? What was happening musically? Uh, well, it was the folk days, you know, folk musicians. I was a folk musician, and uh, uh, it, it was great to live in Laurel Canyon because it was five minutes away from Sunset Strip and all the clubs and record companies, the Troubadour, where everybody hung out every single night. And the good thing about living in Laurel Canyon was if your car wouldn't start, you could coast all, all the way down <laughs> the gas station. <laughs> But Laurel Canyon was all curvy hills, and there were no yards and no sidewalks, so people with families generally didn't live up there. A few did, but mostly single people lived up there in little cabins off the road. If you drove up there, you wouldn't see very much, except a lot of cars parked and roads, and because everybody was off in their little, their little, you know, cabins, little houses, practicing chords and. And you know, everybody knew everybody back then, and, and they were sharing chords, you know, you'd hang out with your fellow musicians, say, look at this great chord I learned, oh, let me see that, how do you do that? And, and there was a lot of that camaraderie going on, um, and uh, one day I picked up a camera on the road and started photographing all these friends of mine that lived up there. It wasn't a plan, I mean, I didn't plan to take all those pictures, but it just happened. <laughs> And then they all got famous. That was great. When do you arrive? Uh, I came out uh, from Boston when I was about 12. So I ended up, uh, my mother and I just uh, sat up on the train. Uh, and um, we, I arrived when I was about 12, right at that. Uh, of Selma and uh, Gower Street. Actually, we stayed there for about a week. Ended up in uh, Beachwood Canyon, and uh, that was that was my my start. So I remember in the eighth grade, I, I went to Blessed Sacrament, uh, which was uh, at Sunset in Cherokee. Went to grammar school there, and uh, I remember going to a party in the eighth grade, the bottom of Laurel Canyon. And I just thought it was this kind of crazy, mystical place. And that was the first time ever I ever really saw Laurel Canyon. And uh, I ended up starting, ending up arriving there in about 1963, the end of 63, and I've been there since. Yeah. And um, I, I, live, uh, I live up next door to Mickey's old house. Um, and I knew Mickey obviously then. So I've been up there since. Yeah. You know, interesting, doing research, Harvey, in your book, and Michael Walker's book, and others, there was this, and I think, Henry, you had mentioned this, that sometimes, and those of you who lived up there, you could you'd be out hearing music through your window, or you'd be out in the yard and you'd hear a neighbor playing. I mean, it sounds really idyllic. It sounded like, wow, you can't get any perfect, a more perfect environment oh, for right. musicians making music in a situation that was beautiful. You were five minutes away, like you say, from the sprawl of Los Angeles. You had a million miles away. Um, it was, sounded like it was pretty perfect. Art, you were here. Talk about that. I came out with my partner, Paul, Art and Paul, and uh, talked Doug Weston into hiring us at the Troubadour. Uh, he was about to close at that time, and uh, the way we talked him into it was uh, he allowed us to sleep in the dressing rooms. So <laughs> after we were there for 14 weeks, uh, I looked for a place to live. This was in 1961. And um, moved up to this, I drove up the streets of Stanley Hills Drive. I'll never forget it. I stopped someplace and I said, you know, you no know any place to rent up here. And some guy was standing on his porch, and he looked at me, and he says, somebody has to die before you can find a place up here. <laughs> I, swear, I swear to you, I drove up the street, and there was the coroner's car. <laughs> <laughs> at the top of Stanley Hills Drive, I, I, and the 
guy was standing there and he looked at me and he said, you know, better come back tomorrow. <laughs> I, came back, I came back the next day with my dog, who I traveled with all the time, I think, and, um, and I knocked on the door and the guy answered the door and I said, you know, you got a place. He said, well, it's a little teeny room back there and we're just in the process of cleaning it up, but if you're going to live here with your dog, you got to, you know, make sure the dog doesn't get out of the yard. So I, I promised him I'd build a fence. And I moved into Stanley Hills Drive. Uh, this is my first experience in Laurel Canyon. I lived in five different houses in Laurel Canyon up for the next 15 years, and every one of them's got a story, so just stop me. <laughs> Anytime. Any, anyway, I moved in with my dog. I built the fence. I went up to Laurel Canyon last Saturday, and the fence is still there. Gail, <laughs> yeah, you live in one of the most famous houses. You guys get there. Frank was there early, but you and Frank actually move into the log cabin in 68, if I'm not mistaken. Is that right? Yeah. Talk about that. How did that happen? Well, that was a miracle. But I, when I first met Frank, he was living in Kirkwood, and he'd been there for a time, and that was in 66. So I, I'm sure he was a resident since at least 65. And then, uh, but the log cabin, so in those days, there was a huge eucalyptus tree, the oldest one in Southern California, that engulfed the place. So you really couldn't see it from the street. And I was coming down Lookout Mountain, and it was in an open top car with a record producer named Nick Benet, who did uh, Lumpy Gravy with Frank. And um, we were house hunting. And he was with me because the thing that you need to know about Laurel Canyon is, in those days, A, it was cheap, uh, certainly up Kirkwood, cheap rent, which was you know, such a boon to starving musicians. And also, um, they wouldn't rent, nobody would rent a long hair, so to, you know, they you couldn't. So he was posing as my husband, and we were moving back from New York, and um, we were driving around trying to, you know, meeting real estate people and it, all this sort of thing. And I'm sitting in there, at, we're just at the light, and I said, I don't know how the fuck we're gonna find a place that we're gonna fit all these people into. You know, because it's a whole entourage, and because uh, we were bringing band members, a secretary, a, the resident artist, and, his, and possibly two guys that lived with him, and it was just uh, insane. And then you know, John Mayall was also moving in with us, and it was it was crazy. And I'm sitting there saying this, and I said, I'll never find a place. And I hear this voice; it's right there. And I'm like, Nick and I look at each other. What? Did you hear that? And if anybody has been at that intersection, look up immediately to, uh, if you're facing, look out to your um, left. Is this left? Because I can never remember. Okay, left. <laughs> and there's a driveway that goes up some ways back in the road, but right at the top, there's a perch. And Carl Franzoni, does anybody know who Carl uh, Franzoni uh, is? <laughs> okay, he was sitting up there, and he says, there's your house right there. And I'm like, right where? Because there's just this big tree. And he says, the log cabin. And he introduced us to the landlady and helped us rent that place for $1,400 a month, which was an insane fortune at that time. And all the freaks that were living there for no rent had to move out. <laughs> and the rest of us all moved in. <laughs> wow. You had a bowling alley. Right. Yeah, there was a bowling alley downstairs. Yeah. <laughs> Harvey, a question for you. Yeah. I'm from the East Coast. And the closest thing that I could think of, and of course Woodstock later on, which was an artist colony for New York, is a place to go, kind of like, I guess kind of like Laurel Canyon, but most of the activity uh, was happening in Greenwich Village. LA is the second largest city, New York first, and yet the scenes and the way the scenes formed were very, very different. Can you comment on that? We didn't have snow days in West Hollywood. Well, climate was... <laughs> <laughs> what weather was very important because uh, you weren't dealing with snow and lots of rain and studios and transportation and parking was not a problem. So interactions and cross pollination was really easy to do. It, it, it was a rustic world five minutes from Sunset Boulevard, but I think the key thing about uh, freedom, creativity, cross pollination, everybody up here. And, and I got this from the DJ Elliot Mintz, who, when I was researching uh, the Canyon book, 
I never, I had a paper route in Laurel Canyon, I skateboarded there, I was going to Fairfax High, you know, West Hollywood, a mile and a half from it, and, and um, I never saw cop cars or sheriff, now where it was West Hollywood police, sheriff stations, cops, but they were so preoccupied uh, frisking people for cur curfew, uh, getting crazy about interracial couples, uh, people with long hair, 95% of the paranoia and fear or security or police doing their job was on Santa Monica Boulevard or Melrose. The people in Laurel Canyon were sort of left alone and as far as security, there were like two people on bikes called West Tech Security, two guys with flashlights. <laughs> so all the parking and all the good stuff was happening out there because you, there weren't dozens of cop cars. It wasn't the Dragnet TV show because everybody was, you know, a mile or two away. So you had a lot of people that could stay up past 10 o'clock at night up there, or people under 18, or all night parties, and it wasn't too crazy, at least from, from my viewpoint, but uh, it was an, an inclusive world, where, you know, kids in high school could uh, go to people's houses, or people pick you up hitchhiking, and, and things like that, and so you had people that were either reinventing themselves, coming from the East Coast, or guys like Mickey Grant High School, or Danny uh, Notre Dame High School, uh, you had guys that are actually, you know, went to school out here, were actually like real LA people like myself. And so, uh, you know, there was a sense of, uh, you know, brotherhood and stuff like that, or Henry Tad Diltz, you know. <laughs> you didn't know these people. I didn't know that Henry Diltz was going to be a, a big photographer one day. It's a guy that had a banjo in a car, you know, and all of a sudden, in fact, you stopped playing music for a while. But, uh, and so you see it all coalesce a half a century later, and, and you know, I mean, I'm thrilled. Thrilled to be here. Henry won't be playing music for the next six months. I have his banjo. <laughs> he can take it anytime he wants. Great. How about the jamming? Was there, I mean, with so many musicians up there, so many all over the place, was there a lot of jamming going on? Was there a lot of songwriting sessions? Were there things happening where the creative element just was unbelievable? Well, well I. Uh, at my house, there was a lot of jamming, but it was just at parties in my little uh, studio that I had in, in the in the garage that I converted to a recording studio. But it wasn't; it was just party jamming. It, it wasn't like uh, you know serious recording studio sessions and let's all get together and write and then record something because that's what I was doing every day for my job. Right. So uh, you know, at night or at parties or stuff, I would. It was just more of a a party. I have tapes. I have hours and hours of tapes of, of everybody down there in that little studio. Dan, you remember that little studio down there? Spiral staircase to your bed. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, that's Let's not talk bad. about that one, Dan. <laughs> uh, this is all going to be you know, <laughs> Thank you. That's enough. No. <laughs> uh, staircase, if you want that. Certainly. That's the stairway to heaven. I, I have the staircase. I you have that staircase? I have the staircase. How did you get that staircase? I stole it out of the house that was abandoned. <laughs> so it was more like just, you know, I had a party that went on for three or four days and, and people would just go down. And I've listened to the tapes and it's total crap. I mean, it's just... <laughs> Good blow. <laughs> I wrote that. Joel, so. what about you? <laughs> when did you get there? Uh, we got there probably in. Uh, I'll, I'll start with we're, we're from San Francisco, <clears throat> and uh, we were playing. Uh, we were called the Bedouins before the Grassroots. Uh, that was our first name, and uh, we uh, we uh, played the uh, the Battle of the Bands at the Teenage Fair. Yeah. 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 And, and, and we won in uh, up in. Uh, we came in first or second in San Mateo. Mm -hmm. And um, Lou Adler, along with Elmer Valentine, flew up to San Francisco. They were looking for a band. They had an idea with P.F. Sloan and with Steve Berry and Lou and, uh, and, and the engineer Bones Howe. They wanted, uh, they wanted a, a voice and a band to fulfill what the grassroots were. They had some demos already. So we flew to L.A. Uh, I was 16. Uh, we recorded at Western Studio 3 for probably uh, two days, three days. Uh, we, put, we recorded four, uh, like 14 tracks. One of the tracks we did was Eva Destruction by Barry McGuire. And uh, unfortunately, that kind of put our... <laughs> from then on, uh, two months later, we were on the Ed Sullivan Show. Our parents had to fly to L.A. to sign our recording track with Lou and Dunhill Records, Jay Lasker and everybody that was there. 
and uh, from pretty much uh, in that same session, Where Were You When I Needed You was cut, and The Ballad of a Thin Man, Mr. Jones, and Bob Dylan song. And uh, so that's how we ended up in L.A. Then Elmer, uh, Elmer Valentine, put us in at the trip on Sunset Boulevard across from Ben Frank's, where we were the house band. And we played opposite Smokey and the Miracles and, and James Brown and every band that came through there. So we got our education right there at the trip. Stay with me one second. The idea of a rivalry between San Francisco and L.A. music scenes at, the, at that point. Was there one? Well, there was this other band called The Leaves. Yeah. And then there was, uh, <laughs> but yeah, there was a lot of, and, you know, Arthur Lee and Love, they played at Beat Olitos. And that was uh, Arthur Lee and, 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 and those guys. Uh, I played with, with them a little bit. There, the, you know, there was an amount of rivalry until we got together and started to play. Mm -hmm. You know, that was pretty much once, once the music started, everybody kind of went together. And the rivalry was one-sided, San Francisco against L.A. Yeah. Yeah. We all left yeah. up San Francisco, yeah. San Jose, Mountain View. I mean, we didn't waste any psychic energy. He's talking. Player hating. <laughs> yeah, but I, I would say that uh, L.A. started about a year earlier than San Francisco. Yeah. And uh, never, the, the press kind of glommed on to the summer of love kind of thing, but everything was going on down here early. I, I remember going to, to a session uh, to see, uh, I did, the, uh, I did uh, Dick Clark and uh, the, uh, the uh, Loving Spoonful, uh, Do You Believe in Magic? And I went to the session and, uh, oh, the, oh, it's, not, it's not my tea. Uh, and uh, I went there and and I said, what, "Where where is the uh, you know to to the door?" And they said, "Where is the, where is the the spoonful?" He says, "Well, you want the spoonful, or you want these other guys from San Francisco?" It was it was their Jeff Jefferson airplane for a recording next door. Uh, where they, in fact, a year later, where uh, Rolling Stones did Satisfaction. It was all happening um, in L.A. Was that Western Studio 3? No, 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 on, on uh, Sunset. The, uh, RCA. RCA. RCA on Sunset. A, a lot of stuff was being done there. And in fact, I did uh, my second single there, my third single, Fun I Love Can Be, and Frank, Frank came to the session for that. So a lot of stuff was all done down in L.A., and for some reason the press glommed on to it later. I mean, the Sunset Strip, you, you know, I mean, man. You were before, the session. Yeah. Yeah, I was at the freak out session. Densmore was there and all that stuff. But uh, but it all was happening in L.A. and for some reason the press kind of I don't know why it all ended up being well, the summer that, of that love part, in San Francisco a year later or six months later. That part the Monterey Pop Festival. I'm something to Yeah, honor. but that, 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 that was all that was but that was all designed that was all done down in L.A. Brian Wilson, right. Adler. I mean everybody. John it was Phillips. all done. Yeah. It was all done. Mamas and Papas. It's all done in L.A., and for some reason, history kind of makes it the summer of love a year later. What were you going to say? No, no, no. Okay. Go ahead, John. So the way uh, Frank would have told this story, not exactly the way he would have told it, but I can tell you a few details so he wouldn't have spared you. It was that there was corporate, that rivalry was created for the benefit San Francisco? Of, yeah. That rivalry was created by corporate uh, enterprises, such as Bill, the Bill Graham Organization, um, basically, Los Angeles was freak, the freak scene, and San Francisco was the hippie scene, and that's kind of the way that they set it up. And a bunch of guys in suits came to visit Frank very early on and said, if you move to San Francisco, will you help us create this scene there? And he said, fuck you. And that was that. Stop there because you said freak and hippie, and this is seriously yes. educational. Describe it. What is the difference between a freak and a hippie? Well, if anybody ever read the definition that Frank provided on the album Freak Out, it clearly uh, states, which I can't remember, the <laughs> words and the order of the words, but there's a whole paragraph that really is addressing uh, people who are choosing to live their lives in a certain way and not be bound by the constrictions of society. Whereas hippies, all you needed was to go to Sears and buy a poncho and you were set for the weekend. <laughs> well, uh, I can mean, tell you, I, I just... Uh, I have a different thing about it because uh, I remember with uh, uh, with uh, with uh, the the, uh, the birds and uh, what's our, what's our, what's our crazy guy that followed them around uh, Vito 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 and his wife she kind of actually started the whole right. 
the, the whole clothing thing, that was the whole hippie thing, and I remember I loved that because all the girls didn't wear panties. <laughs> <laughs> wow, you wore know the apartment too. Yeah. <laughs> but, no, but, but actually, all of the, that whole style of clothing all was kind of like uh, uh, Vito, Vito, this crazy artist that started, and, and, correct me if I'm wrong, what, that was that was before the whole San Francisco thing. Yes, it was. You're yeah. right about that. Yeah. He was and, and, and all went, all went north. Yeah. How to sculpt and get it. I think it's like, important to, yeah. I think it is important to, you know, acknowledge the fact that the whole hippie freak, whatever, how, whatever terms we want to use, it didn't come out of the blue. It wasn't just overnight that this, you know, zeitgeist all of a sudden just appeared. It was an extension, a morphing from the uh, uh, beatnik. Uh, era and I just caught the tail end at a coffee shop on Coinga called the Omnibus, but they were still in there all in black, you know. And they were, you know, I was 20, 19, 20, and they were 25 or maybe pushing 30, and they were still doing Jack Kerouac and Neil Cassidy, and <clears throat> yeah, I watched that morph into what we call the hippies, but it was essentially the same sensibility, not as dark, you know, the, the beatniks were post, post-war, post and it was angry young men, and it was very dark, and uh, Allen Ginsberg, and you know, all these people, and then I just watched it, you know, uh, given a, a huge nudge by Pete Seeger, and that whole, the whole folk music thing meeting this kind of Kerouac, you know, beatnik environment, and I watched it like, it was a very short period of time. I mean, it was only maybe months. And to me, it seemed like a long time, but it probably was only a few months from 62, 63, 64, until the Beatles, of course. It was this, you know, this weird cusp. You know, it was a very interesting time, and it, had, it was a very short little cusp, about that yeah. long. Uh, but I definitely remember that happening. And the yeah. undercurrent of that is like, even going back to the late 50s in Venice West, the beatnik stuff, the subterraneans, uh, very well-read audience stuff, and folk music, and people being politicalized, uh, housing discrimination yeah. stuff. Along before the 65 Watts riots, there were all these concerns going back 10 and 20 years, including uh, maybe people on this panel, their parents or people they knew in school, affected by HUAC and the Red Scare and all that. And so there had to be some kind of friction against that. But what happened in the 60s, the, the seeds were planted post maybe Korean War, and and um, and Mickey and I have talked about the on the bus. There was folk music plus a lot of these people like, um, well Henry coming to town from Hawaii or Danny Hutton or, or Mickey. I mean these people were like parking cars and doing talent shows like at the Red Velvet Club in 62, 63, 64, and and not a lot of cover versions either. Their own original music, so it wasn't some kumbaya moment or covering Pete Seeger exclusively. So people on stage, even pre-home studios and record deals were like playing music or even reading books or, or dancing. So it was it was building, as Mickey said, a few years before. Then it got more pronounced in wardrobe and, and clothing and things like that. Well, yeah. may, I, may I say, I think it would really carry it in a strange way was uh, coffee houses. Because you could, you, you went from that whole beatnik thing and you slowly transitioned into the folk thing, but you didn't have to have a liquor license. So you could, for for a very, uh, you could actually carry carry about like uh, like Terry Lee at the Garrett, uh, which I loved. When I went to high school, there was not an age limit, so you could you could kind of nurse all of these kids through this whole period of time, and they could go. I remember uh, there was Joe Gillis on the uh, uh, TV and all of a sudden, you could be kind of like this beatnik kind of guy, and it slowly turned into, all of a sudden, there's Theodore Baikel, their uh, the incredible actor, uh, which blew my mind at the, the Garrett. I went, this is, a, this is a serious actor. He's there, sitting there doing the, the Lincoln Brigade, you know, st stuff about the Spanish War, and all of a sudden it slowly turned from jazz. Shelley's Manhole still was there on Coingo Boulevard. That was kind of a jazz place. But it slowly morphed into the folk thing, and you know, turn electrical later, but you could do it for a very inexpensive right. price. You could start a place and not have to worry about a liquor license. And, and some of the kind places of like the Ash Grove were all ages too, so you can have an 18 or 21 right. age limit, so kids could actually see 
blues people and folk people, or Jim Dixon and uh, Ben Shapiro at the Renaissance Club, 62 and 63, would actually show mixed media slideshows and movies and all this kind of stuff. So these these things were going on, you know, years years earlier. Henry, um, you know, we're talking about the early days here of, of how the scene evolved, and we talked about San Francisco and the little competition. From where I stand. San Francisco certainly explodes, particularly in 66 and 67. But when you look at the length of the scene, in terms of being very creative and, and really uh, contributing to the overall American well, world rock and roll scene, L.A. just keeps going. We hit the end of the 60s and go right into the 70s, and boom, now we're in singer-songwriter, and we, are, we have a whole new generation of young people, Joni Mitchell, Jackson Brown, many others, J.D. Salad, great songwriters, who are now carrying us in, six, in 71, 72, San Francisco's kind of, they're not contributing the way L.A. is. You saw it. Yeah, it's true. Well, um, <clears throat> well f we, had, we had folk music really happening in L.A. a lot, you know, before, it seems like before San Francisco. Yeah. By the way, I thought we were hippies and they were freaks. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, they took all the acid up there and had those great well, posters right. and all that, that's you know. But, but then, so we were all folk singers, and then when when the Beatles played at Sullivan, that was a huge sea change because all the folk groups saw that performance that night, including our group, and they said, "Man, you know, we what are we singing about an ox driver for? We can be doing music." So we went out and we traded our stand. We, we traded our stand-up bass on an electric bass. The next week we went electric, and then you know people started writing songs because before when you nobody wrote folk songs. I mean there, those were songs by sailors and miners and cowboys written a hundred years before, and you always tried to find new old songs that nobody had discovered before. And then the Beatles and Bob Dylan at the same time kind of showed the way to write your own songs. Jackson Brown, there was a great DVD called The Troubadours, and he said, the first time I heard Bob Dylan, I thought, oh, I get it. It's kind of a pop song, but it's personal. <laughs> and, and, and that kind of sums it up, you know. Before there were songwriters and there were singers. Frank Sinatra never wrote any songs. Um, you know, Elvis Presley never wrote any songs. The songwriters wrote those, but then that big huge thing happened in Laurel Canyon where you know where all these people started writing songs I mean Joni Mitchell, Stephen Stills, Neil Young, James Taylor, Paul Simon on the East Coast and that was a huge change you know and in, in, uh, in all the record companies were in LA there really weren't very many fantasy records was up there in San Francisco but most of them were here in LA that's why you know that whole singer-songwriter thing really happened here well, I always, yeah, I always kind of thought of San Francisco as a social scene, and yeah. in, in L.A. was an industry town. Yeah. Right. It still is. I mean, this is, you know, this is where the business sort of happened, and all the record companies were here, and the, and the San Francisco scene was kind of a social, you know, kind of, you know. You're right about that. Lisa. Situation, what? You're right about that. <laughs> I think so, yeah. yeah and, and and this was an industry town, and it still is. That's and the few, uh, you know, San Francisco and the Bay Area had a few recording studios, but the, the new technology and the big studios were here, and I'll let everybody in a little secret, you know, uh, the first four or five Jefferson Airplane records were recorded at RCA Studios, a couple of Grateful Dead records were recorded there, uh, part of Janis Joplin, the big brother, you know, was done at Columbia's. Most of the groups had the Janis Joplin. So as much as this place was plastic and phony and we had LA, they sure liked coming down here and they recorded all their best stuff here. Somebody had to push the envelope for all those artists to be free to write their own material because record companies would not sign bands that did not sound like somebody else and they could put their stuff on the radio. So everybody began sounding like the same. And I can tell you it was no fun living on Kirkwood between the peanut butter conspiracy on one side and the strawberry alarm clock on the other. <laughs> so, and then the women were not getting, you couldn't, I was going to ask was, you about that. Women were singing folk songs, you know, of course, but kudos to Joan Baez. 
and Bob Dylan for, and both of them for making that happen for both, for each other. But on the other hand, it wasn't until you uh, had independent male stars pushing the envelope, or idols or whatever, whether they were guitar players or singers, uh, until that happened, you did not have people writing their own stuff because clubs wouldn't even hire bands that played original music. And so um, you couldn't work. So uh, what I want to say is thank you to Janis Joplin for being one of the first to go out there and do it for the rest of the women. And then finally, um, because men started writing their individual stuff, you know, women could get their foot in the door as well because they were all singing back up anyway, so they knew everybody already. <laughs> but boy, when Joni Mitchell hits the scene, that yeah. sure changes. I mean, from what I know, not being here, she changes everything. Well, you mentioned the uh, uh, Greenwich Village earlier, yeah. and I'd heard, I don't remember, you might remember the reference, but I heard that the, the village, New York, did frown on the whole West Coast, especially Los Angeles in those early days. And I heard that it was when Joni Mitchell chose to live in Laurel Canyon, she came out here and started writing and singing here. I understood that that's when the East Coast uh, and New York and the Village said, oh, well, maybe it's not that bad. Well, she'd already <laughs> tried New York, Florida, Florida, Greenwich Village, and, and Canada, and all of a sudden she's on Reprise Warner Brother Records, and, and these things are built on the su success of the Monkees and the Grassroots, the Association, and everybody else who are selling lots of records and are all the TV shows, so it's not it's not the Ed Sullivan show, which, which makes everybody go electric and be in bands, but it's the eruption after that makes everybody move here. I mean, uh, as a native of LA, a guy born on the border of East Hollywood and Los Angeles, overlooking the Hollywood 101 freeway, I can't tell you what it was like in the late 50s and all through the 60s with one-eighth as many people in this town. <laughs> uh, and no speed limit on the freeways and everything. So transportation and all that, everybody kind of knew each other more and then things, all the migration happened largely uh, from people from uh, New York um, for career situations or relocations. And all the record labels started opening up West Coast branches and offices and all of a sudden they're wearing Nehru shirts and all that. And all of a sudden they're not making fun of this place anymore. They're sort of digging uh, living here and living up in the hills. Yeah. So they're not missing that snowstorm that much. Yeah. <laughs> On the other so hand, best. I think um, I just have to say for Frank that the single most important factor about what happened here in Southern California is the fact that, and everywhere across this country, uh, eventually and ultimately, is the fact that the median age of this country in 1965 was 25. So you had half the population of the country under the age of 25, and they wanted the vote, and they wanted a whole lot of other stuff, but they more than anything else wanted their music. I'm going to ask Henry and Art this question. You guys have been here a while, in, in, in the early 60s. What artist from Laurel Canyon didn't make it, but absolutely positively should. Had the talent, just didn't have whatever. Is there anyone that comes to mind? Oh my God! If Wild Man Fisher. Brought to you by. Where's the Bob? Hold on. Art. 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 Yeah, I could yeah, have him make because he's going to make him. I'm talking about who didn't get a deal or something like that. Frank Zappa. Henry's always cited Judy Sill. You and I have. You got Judy Sill. She dies early. You know, that's how it was. All right, and we got Henry Rhodes. And Henry Rhodes. I was in the original Mary Brown with him, and you should have made it. Yeah, yeah. Anybody, do you have anybody else? Danny, anybody you can think of? Emmett Rose, good one, yeah. I just gave, I just oh, gave it. Oh, you gave it. Hey, he's from the Come Bay Area. On. Give me a break, you want two now. Hey, all right, so a couple of more, and I'm going to open it up to the audience, but very, very quickly. Is there a song, is there one song that you could come up with off the top of your head that is most indicative of what Laurel Canyon was and means? Go ahead, hold on, hold on. Art? Okay, in 1960. 
1961, I was just about to go on the road with the new Christie Minstrels. We did a lot of rehearsing up in Laurel Canyon, by the way. Uh, McGuire and, well, there are stories there. I visited a close friend of mine who is still a close friend, a gal by the name of Tony Stern, who lived on Kirkwood Drive. And she used to read me her little poetry. And her poems were very, very beautiful. I remember one poem she used to read to me all the time. I'd play the guitar, she'd read her poem. It went something like, it's too late, baby, baby, it's too late. <laughs> Years later, Carol King moved up to Laurel Canyon. Uh, I think uh, she had just broken up with her husband, and she moved up there, and the two became friends. And Lou Adler approached Carol and said, Carol, why don't you write a personal album? And Carol uh, uh, purportedly said, uh, I, you know, I've never uh, done anything like that. I've only written songs for other groups. He said, no, just sit down and write some personal songs. So um, basically, they got together for coffee and tea in the morning. Tony was not a lyricist. Tony was just a lovely person who lived up there. She liked to paint and write poems. And somehow or other, two of Tony's poems ended up uh, with Tony's getting full credit on it. Um, years later, I was in Los Angeles driving my car. I wrote a song about this, by the way. Um, I was in my car driving my car, and I had left the music business, and I was rushing to work to get there for a weekend job, and I remember hearing that song hit the radio, and I said to myself, why do I know those lyrics? Why do I know those lyrics? I called Tony, and I said, Tony, did you? She said, yep. And that's... That's Is that your song? That's a lot right, of Anybody else story. have a, well, I was thinking mamas and papas, young girls that come into the canyon, and that was saying, in the morning you can see them walking. Okay. Everybody else? I have, I have two songs. I, I agree the the Tapestry album, the song he's talking about, it's too late, not because I wrote the liner notes for the Tapestry reissue, but also uh, another Goffin King pairing, uh, Pleasant Valley Sunday, sung by the Monkees. Yeah. Yeah. Fantastic vocal, Nicky Dolan's tremendous, Eddie Hohen drums, baby. Uh, just tremendous song that uh, it sort of birthed the New Jersey, it, written there, but it, it came to fruition on the West Coast. And uh, I mean, that to me, that just becomes such a West Coast anthem. Everybody else, the trip back. California Dreamin', I think, is one. I mean, Sweet Judy Blue Eyes is one. I'd say everybody must get stoned. <laughs> was it written there? Oh, <laughs> no, but some of the recording was going to come to the yeah, sunset. Don't you know. no bogart that joint. <laughs> <laughs> uh, interesting side note about Pleasant Valley Sunday that uh, that uh, years later, uh, decades later, I, I was doing a concert and this wonderful, very educated gentleman came up. He was uh, Afro-American. I think he was a doctor or something like that. Uh, and he was very eloquent and he was really a lovely guy and he was a big fan. And he said, I loved all of your guys' stuff, but I had an issue with Pleasant Valley Sunday. And I was like, what? And he said, well, you know, I grew up in a, you know, sort of an urban, you know, not quite a ghetto, but it was a very d distressed environment. And that song came out, and if you remember the lyrics, is. But Mrs. Green, she has her roses, and the guy has a barbecue, and everybody has televisions and a lawn and a bar. He said, you know, we'd have killed for a barbecue <laughs> and a lawn. So it was a really interesting moment for me. All scenes come to an end, or fade out, or evolve into something else. Laurel Canyon as we know, it's a 65-ish, which is what the exhibit is, to say mid to late 70s. That's a long time for a scene to be continuously productive. First question, and then the last question is going to be what happened. But before I ask you that and then turn it over to the audience, how come it lasted for so long? How did you have such regenerative powers to be able to go from basically 64, 65 to about 78, 79? and some major periods in there in the 60s and in the early and mid 70s. Pretty, incre pretty incredible, pretty impressive with the amount. When we started this exhibit, we thought, yeah, we'll be able to handle it. I, I look at that exhibit now and say, my God, I need another five rooms to truly tell the story because it's so far more complex than we thought. There's a lot of depth to it. There's so many albums, so many artists to talk about. Why was it able to go for such a long period of time? What was the staying power? It's power such a beautiful place to live. It's just, it's beautiful up there. It's, it's heaven. For a kid from Greenwich Village, who I, I came out of Brooklyn to Greenwich Village singing there, 
came to California when I first drove up Laurel Canyon and said, you mean I could live in a place like this? Cheaper than I can buy and get a, 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 a one bedroom joint down in the Lower East Side? I mean, that's like dying and going to heaven. Okay, so certainly the environment. What else, Danny? Uh, and then, you know, it has to change. It really, you're saying it as if it ended. Yeah. Uh, there's well, so I'm many I, If you read the English English magazines now, Arctic Monks, oh, yeah. these, everybody in the world, I, I'm in a studio in my house. I, I, I have uh, Alice Cooper's old house. Yeah. And uh, we have a studio there. And Jimmy Cliff uh, uh, did all the vocals at the studio. And they have the, the, uh, got the Grammy for... The, the best reggae album of the year. I mean, so it's still yeah, completely course. vibrant. Uh, and, and I think a lot of it, like they said, it's just the weather and it's that kind of, uh, it's that legendary kind of place that but clearly, uh, everybody but clearly hears. The, it, it changes from when you guys are initiating it in the early and mid 1960s. By 1977, 78, the vibe is different. America is different. Yeah. What's different? What were changes up there big time? Yeah. I, I think there are two changes, two major changes. One is a lot, uh, for a long time, there was a really vibrant, which is coming back, I'm happy to say, um, a live music scene in Los Angeles. And so the artists that were working and living in, Los, in uh, Laurel Canyon could just get in their car and drive to work and you know perform on a stage somewhere in LA and so it was, it was cool but the other thing is no one on this panel or anywhere in this room I am willing to put money down on the table and bet that anyone could imagine disco side by side with <laughs> ever, anything anything at all from Laurel Ken <laughs> I'm not saying it's not it's, right. it's true. Uh, a few things. Uh, it got to continue. Well, first of all, uh, it starts declining in 1971. It's something that I put in my book. 71. For for one reason, and these guys are witnesses to it, and so are, so am I. Bad earthquake in 1971. Silmar-based earthquake. Uh, their people were living in houses in Warren County and they're built on stilts. So people like John Densmore from my book were telling me everybody put their house up for sale in 71, was splitting by 72 and 73. Yes, they were getting married, they were having kids, but that earthquake was really scary. I mean, our chimney collapsed. There's no FEMA or any of that kind of stuff. I mean, it was a, a very bad scene. It was Mother Nature sending a warning signal. And, but the music continued because, and I'm sure Frank was at the forefront of this, like he was always in so much, the concept of the home studio, and not just to make demos or for jamming, but master recordings were done, you know, in home studios away from the corporate machine. And that continued where people were putting out well, records that almost sounded like demos. And, 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 and singer-songwriter people got to birth because they could make a demo, put it out, or just kind of replicate it in another studio or something. And, and disco, the priorities of major labels started showing up and shipping disco stuff. But the big thing why it really dwindled, uh, all the people on this panel got to play music in a pre-pay-to-play environment. Could you imagine Jim Morrison having to go ask 50 people to pre-buy tickets to one of their shows at the Whiskey or something? I mean, so there was no pay-to-play. I mean. People like Elmer Valentine that took chances on largely unsigned bands. And he, yeah, you played for a week sometimes, and, and so there wasn't a lot of that shenanigan involved. So you, that continued. I think there's also a natural half-life, you know, there's a lifespan to any, any uh, uh, generation. And it, the, the, the years that you, that you just uh, outlined is about a generation. Yeah. And it just moves on. Life moves on, and people move on, and the the, the the kids, you know, they want something else than what their their parents and their older brothers and sisters did. So I think a lot of it was just a natural, you know, evolution. Yeah, yeah, uh, you know, a zeitgeist. You know, it's just you know, there's that word again. But it just moves on. You know? The drummer's got a lot something. better. Was that? <laughs> 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 a lot of burnout uh, that happened that we saw right in front of you. Oh, Right. <laughs> what? <laughs> what? <laughs> Henry, did you have a, uh, something? Well, that, the earthquake wasn't only in Laurel Canyon. Yeah, but just. Was it? I mean, I, I think it went on into the middle of the 70s. 
in yeah, 72 but, was but people, legal but people, so, No, but people living, they got out of the canyon and started going to Topanga and the yeah. valley and stuff like that. You left like, in mid 70s. Like yeah, so. but, but I think a lot of, well, a lot of the groups got well known and moved to Malibu, you know, and then other people got married and had kids. It's kind of hard also to have got kids crowded. up there. There's no lawns, really. Traffic no also got lawns. traffic. <laughs> Well, it evolves. I think that's probably the safest, most accurate yeah. city. Oh. It evolves. Things yeah, change. Yeah. No parking now. <laughs> but, but there's a lot of musicians up there now. There's some great yeah. musicians yeah. living up there now. I mean, like Gail said, it's coming back yeah. around again. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Let me take this point to ask Eric, if you put the lights up a little bit, but let's get a few questions from the audience. How about it? Point to these guys a quick hand. In the back, yes. With uh, where are you? In the, yeah, go ahead. The, the hat. Uh, first, I, I, Loud and stand up. I have a question for Henry, but first I have to say the song that Art talked about um, about the about Tony is an amazing song. It's on his new album, and please pick it up because it's my favorite song. It's wonderful, Art. <laughs> but Henry, I heard a story, and I wanted to see if it was true. I heard that your band was supposed to play. The Ed Sullivan show around the same time the Beatles did, but he canceled it for a really interesting reason. Yeah, yeah. We, uh, <laughs> well, um, there was a period of a, a part of a year we moved to New York and lived in New York in 64, 65. And we were booked, Herbie Cohen, our manager, booked us on the Ed Sullivan show. But we had a friend, Jimmy Gavin's father was prophetic and he, had, he was psychic. He had a prophetic dream that New York was going to fall into the ocean. <laughs> And so when Cyrus, who was in our group, and his wife Renee said, well, we're not going to stick around for that. We're moving back to L.A. And that was a week before we were going to play on the Ed Sullivan show, which was a week before the Beatles played. So it wouldn't have mattered anyway. You know, the Beatles played, and it changed anyway. But we moved out of New York and didn't never play Ed Sullivan. Would you have played to Maradio? The ox driver song? Yeah. Let's get another question. Yes, sir. Pat. I want to ask Gail Zappa about you and Frank existing there in that context. When Frank was really quite different from all the other musicians, he wasn't a hippie, he didn't smoke pot, he wasn't a folk musician. How did you guys exist in that context? Good question. I would say uh, isolation. <laughs> Just like. Uh, well, first of all, he was driven, and he was uh, a working constantly. I mean, Frank was famous even in those days for carrying around a briefcase. And in the briefcase, you will see one of the things that's on exhibit here is an, uh, an, a bottle of India ink from Judy Green Music. Um, and then he had paper, you know, music paper and pens and pencils and a, these elaborate set of erasers. And that was what was, he carried around with him. He was always writing music whenever he was not in the house. And when he was in the house, he was at the piano and, and working. So he really didn't have, um, I mean, you know, there were moments, of course, because I obviously have children. But, um, <laughs> and, and by the way, I just want to say thank you for Moon and Matilda being here tonight. Because Moon was with us at the log cabin, too. So she's a first time resident from the beginning of her life. So, um, uh, yeah, I think that he just had a mission, he had an agenda, he didn't have any tolerance for people who were lazy, but more than that, he didn't have tolerance for people who said they were bored. Because he said, no, you can't say that unless you've tried everything else. <laughs> and we were talking beforehand, Frank passed his early 50s. He does nearly, what'd you say, 65 albums. Yeah. Think wow. about that. That's incredible. So there is no one who comes close in Laurel Canyon, for that matter, anywhere else, that had that kind of output. It was incredible. He must have literally worked all the time. Oh, he, he liked music. Yeah. Uh, that's right. All right, another question. Yes. I'm with KFWB Radio, and they were, we were a, a big rock station in those days. And I'm curious how local radio affected that era from your standpoint. Are you addressing this to anyone, sir? Uh, any, anyone? anyone who wants to, to yeah, who wants to take a stab at that. 
Um, well, I remember KFWB, Channel 98. Uh, <laughs> Save on drugstores. Terrestrial radio, you know, until quite recently was a huge, huge force in, in, in music. Uh, it was the only force in, it was the only way you could ever get your, your, your stuff heard. Uh, in, in this town, as you, as you know, it was KHJ and KFWB. Um, and I, you know, we all, that's the only thing anybody, Amen. anybody of my age all, you know, ever listened to. Um, it, it was the only, the only source of, uh, of, of music and, and distribution. And those were the glory days, you know, uh, despite all the, you know, the intrigue and the payola and the stuff like that. It's still, you know, uh, it, the, you know, the way I looked at it is the cream rises to the top. You know, you can't fool all the people all the time. And I don't care how much payola went on, but you're not going to shove something down people's throats that is really crap. And, you know, they're just not going to go for it. And that even, the, of course, exists to this day. The big difference now, of course, is that uh, there are just so many uh, uh, streams of, and, and avenues of, of distribution and so many different ways to hear the material. Um, uh, that it, it's it's so fractured, you know. The, back then, it was there was only two stations really in Los Angeles, and in every city, maybe only had one or two stations in that. And there was only one chart, you know, cash box or and or billboard, but there weren't multiple charts. It was one pop chart, and you could have Frank Sinatra and the, and the Beatles on the same in the same top ten, and it happened Yeah, it wasn't, a, it wasn't a factionalized world, and you had four principal, the people on the panel were performing artists. Uh, they are byproducts initially of the AM radio band, including KBLA and, and KRL KHJ, KFWB, and then FM. KRLA, that was the Yeah, and then K, FM radio starts end of 66, FM alternative underground progressive radio starts coming in 66, 67 more outlets for albums to be exposed than just singles. So uh, radio is very, very essential. It's a world before Rolling Stone. It's a world before pop critics ruined a lot of stuff, you know, pop music critics. And all of a sudden, the radio, the radio thing started, was very important to get heard. And somebody may get an airplay, but your stuff had to really be good to still be in rotation year after year or decade after decade. Did you guys play Laurel Canyon X? We played everything. everything. Yeah. Yes. Well, anything that made it, you know, it was really a consumer driven. You know, on Hollywood Boulevard. No, 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 no. It's the not stations went off the, uh, <laughs> the stations went off the calls they got. Yeah. And like I say, there was a lot of stuff going on behind the scenes. But you know, the stations went off how many you play a song, and then how many calls they got. I don't know how. Mm -hmm. I, I got. I got to differ with you on consumer driven. If you give the audience out there that's listening ten records and expect them to then pick their favorite, great. But if, if Frank Zappa ever had to rely on AM radio, if, if, it, if it wasn't for... Frank, yeah, if it Frank wasn't is the exception. Uh, but Frank is the exception to what we're talking about on KFWB and KHJ. Yes, but I know. That was it top for 40. FM radio. Yeah. FM, 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 FM was very different. Radio. FM was very different. KRLA was, uh, was yes, huge station. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think... Because the early the late 60s, AM radio with the rise of FM radio, things changed dramatically, and it gets oh, yeah. free form. Huge. Then, not consumer at all. You know, and no. then you're listening to what people are listening to and playing that. We're trying to get one step ahead of them. But it was the same way in New York with WNEW. And other but, I, but I had a secret other life in the early 60s before I met Frank. And one of the things that me and my girlfriend, Anya, Butler managed to do was break a record in Southern California by traipsing around in the shortest possible skirts with the biggest English accents, she actually was English, to flog this record to every DJ in Southern California. And, and eventually I got Elmer to paint the name of the record on the front of the trip and we broke single-handedly my generation by doing that. Yeah. So. I mean, I know a lot about what it takes. If you don't have any money, and you don't have any coke, and you don't have any drugs to give those DJs. And by the way, you keep giving us that dress. Yeah, I know. I have to. I have to bring the dress because somebody said earlier that oh, they were so excited. Oh, I think it was you about the girls not wearing any knickers. Yeah. But I went to the first one of the first dates I had with Frank. 
I wore an, this outfit that, and, and first thing I had to do, acting as a roadie, I had to run in the whiskey and get Frank's aunt from Mario. So I go in and I've got this nice little suit on and we're going, it's my first date. I never heard Frank play, I just heard about him. And we go to this, uh, I can't remember what the hall was, and they passed us hand over hand up the stairway because it was packed in this tiny little hideous room. I think it was the Swedish, I don't even know what it was. But anyway, and I get there and for the first time in my life I see all the freaks, Vito, Sue, all the dance suit and crew, and you know, Carl Franzoni who I already knew. But um, when I got to the whiskey, the first thing that happened is he said, Gail, and he goes up to me and pulls my lapels apart. He said, I can't believe you're not wearing a bra. <laughs> and, and then I go to this uh, club, and all the freaks, except with the exception of, of uh, Vito, are, are wearing underwear under all their doilies. And I'm like, what the fuck is this? Look at that dress too. Yeah, thank you, too. <laughs> I'm sure. I'm sure. Yes, sir. Um, Laurel Canyon is sort of interesting because, as I see it, um, the music that came from it back then was a real renaissance. It was a renaissance of, I mean, it was music that meant something. A lot of the things that came out of there, you know, the artists saw what was going on and they wanted to make it a better place. And they each had their own very personal ways of stating that, be it uh, Joni Mitchell or Carol King or Crosby, Stills and Nash yeah. and that whole thing. So I kind of looked at it as like, well, that's kind of like a state of mind. Do you guys see that with new acoustic acts and other acts and people getting back to songwriting that actually means something, do you see that Laurel Canyon is kind of rising again, and art in particular? Can I start with you? And, now, do you think that there's like a, a Laurel Canyon rising scene? Whether it be Laurel Canyon or not, just that whole divide of Laurel Canyon.